on live. Hello and welcome. My name is Elise Hartman and I'm the Director of Collective Learning and Resources for 313 Reads. I apologize, my camera is not working so you will just hear my voice today. 313 Reads is a coalition committed to working side by side in collective impact with citywide, statewide and national partners towards literacy access, equity and justice to support grade level reading. 313 Reads is dedicated to mobilizing alongside our community to ensure literacy equity so that all students are reading at grade level by the end of third grade. The 313 Reads Professional Learning Series offers evidence-based professional development for our literacy champions. These are educators, literacy assessment core members, and 313 Reads partners. Today, I'm joined by three amazing guests, Dr. Adria Truckenmiller, Amber Gustafson, and Dr. Leah Van Bell. Our topic, a new understanding of dyslexia, a risk resilience model and its implications for literacy equity work. Dr. Truckenmiller, will you please introduce yourself and your work? Great, thank you so much, Elise, for having me and to 313 Reads. It's been a very exciting partnership uh, with you all. I am an associate professor of special education and school psychology at Michigan State University. And my research there revolves around how we can use uh, assessment of reading and writing specifically to guide evidence-based instructional um, strategies and programs in schools within a systems format. Thank you. Amber, please introduce yourself and your work. Hi everyone, my name is Amber Gustafson. Uh, I am the current assessment manager for 313 Reads uh, and I work very diligently with all of our program partners. So hopefully all of you that are watching as well, I have some, some impact with you all. Uh, I also have a background as a high school literacy teacher uh, as well as English as a second other language. And I recently received my master's degree in educational program evaluation and improvement research. Thanks so much for having me, Elise. Thank you, and Dr. Van Bell. Please call me Leah. Hi, I'm Leah Van Bell. Um, I serve the 313 Coalition as the uh, the executive director. Excited to be here today. Um, I'm also wearing my hat um, for the Michigan Reading Association. I serve as the current president um, and really excited about this series and grateful, Elise, to you for championing this. Thank you. And thank you for, for joining us. I'm excited to, uh, to listen and learn. And uh, Leah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so we've been having uh, several uh, learning opportunities about dyslexia. And some folks have asked, you know, why dyslexia? They sort of view it as a, a special education kind of topic, right? And so what we want to center first is Elise provided us that wonderful framing about what the work of 313 Reads is. <clears throat> and one of the things that's core to that is collective learning. We really center and live this idea that we learn collectively, we're all learners, and we're all teachers. And that as we know better, we do better, right? As Dr. Angela has called us to. Um, and in our community, we know that we have some zip codes in Detroit where fewer than 4% of children in grade three are reading at grade level. There's significant need um, to grow access uh, to what little humans and their teachers and their um the folks who are supporting them in the community with literacy, you know, we need to address a lot of access and equity gaps. And dyslexia, um, as we'll discuss today, there are many risk factors for dyslexia that disproportionately affect children in our community, um, including my own child, who is a third grader at a public school in Detroit. Um, and we'll talk more about those factors. But for us, um, when we collectively learn to better meet the needs of children and families and address some of these barriers and um, access issues, um, then collectively we're working towards literacy justice. And that's at the heart of grade level reading. So this is why it's so important to us. And Leah, if you could just transition us into the, the larger discussion. <laughs> That would, be, that would be great as well, because I know that you all have so much rich information to share. And I'd love to hear from Dr. Truckenmiller and Ambier as well. So we're really Thanks, excited. Nice. 
Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, our previous sessions, and we hope that you'll take a look at those recordings and some of the resources that were lifted up, really good stuff. Um, but it's really interesting. I, you know, Adria shared this article with us and it was like, um, mind explosion. Um, I'll say as someone who, you know, was a classroom teacher, was a professor at a university and a graduate director of literacy, trained a lot of people to teach reading and thought, I wish that this model is something that I knew about. And I want to sort of call back former students and say, wait, you need to know about this. And even looking back at the previous sessions that we did as a coalition, the framing really was around dyslexia is this it's neurological in nature. It's about these deficits. Here's how you screen for it. Here's how you have um, interventions for it. Here's how we advocate for policy, such as some of the sort of so-called dyslexia legislation right now. Um, and really, we did not have this framing. And so again, it's like, as we know better, we do better. And it feels really important that we, that we center this model um, because equity is at our center. And so um, Adria, I'll, I'll pivot to you and maybe you can tell us a little bit more about this. I was really excited too, to see that your work is cited within this larger work as well. And clearly it's an area that you have really strong expertise. Thanks, Leah. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think many people can relate to your last comment about um, continually learning. That's why we're all in education. We're all continually learning. And then the other exciting part and um, big value of 313 Reads and value of mine as well is following the science and science continually updates. And so that's what we're doing. We're updating based on the science. And the other um, interesting thing, and they point this out a lot in this article, is that a lot of these pieces on the resilience factors, on a few of the resilience factors are still developing. Right. We don't have settled science on a few of these. And so it'll be really interesting to keep watching this to see how that changes over time. Um, so that being said, um, I just wanted to launch into a, a real quick um, expansion on what Leah said about what dyslexia is and a little bit of the work that um, Michigan more broadly has been doing. So um, recently, uh, um, the Michigan Department of Education and some other stakeholders within um, Michigan put together the Michigan Dyslexia Handbook, which um, was sent out with all of the materials for, for today's talk. And it defines um, dyslexia, how every organization and most um, scientific studies define dyslexia, just as Leah said, is it's a brain-based um, a disability that we diagnose in schools and can address in schools. And so the uh, dyslexia guidance, um, Michigan Dyslexia Handbook does a nice job of defining it in, in a way that is um, a consensus definition and um, guides towards um, what we need to do in schools. And then um, with 313 Reads, some, some things that, that other supports that can be provided. So what I think is um, easiest to grasp when we think about um, what dyslexia is, is that um, print, the concept of print, putting words or oral language onto the page in symbols only developed in the last 6,000 years of human history. And so our brains have developed really, really well for language. We're one of the few species that has <clears throat> a complex language. So we're <clears throat> our brains are developed for that, but they have not yet um, evolved completely for print. So we have to engage different parts of our brains um, and make these connections to make reading efficient. And a lot of children do that really well. Go ahead. And, and, yeah, and Adria, one thing that I think about when I talk about this with folks, because they say like, what do you mean that developing language is natural, but reading is not natural? Reading is like this very natural thing. And it's like, yes, there are some children who, you know, teach themselves to read, so to speak, um, but it's not very common and it requires instruction, right? And, but thinking about even children who, um, are not hearing, who may go on to become speakers of ASL, you know, they go through those same st stages of baby babble and language development in ASL 
parallel to hearing children and developing oral language. So there's something that's so inherent to the human brain that's just like hardwired for language. And it just isn't the same way for learning to read. Yeah, what a great uh, illustration. Thanks, Leah. So the other thing that I find really helpful in that um, dyslexia uh, guidance is on page um, five of the handbook, it has this nice chart of myths versus facts about breaking down the truth about dyslexia. And um, one of the, I mean, all of the myths there are, are so key to our discussion today, um, but just pointing out that there's not just one cause of dyslexia and no two children with dyslexia look exactly the same, right? They're more similar to uh, typically developing readers in so many other ways mm -hmm. than they are to each other. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important to understand each child individually and where they are in their development of reading. Uh, the other key piece is that this dyslexia isn't um, some categorically separate um, type of person, right? It's not a disability that, ex that exists as a separate category. All of us are on our path of, of improving our reading and all of us, we're on a path learning how to read. All of us fluent readers don't remember <laughs> how we learned to read some of us because it happened so quickly or so long ago. Um, so it's important to remember that um, it's, it's, it's all a continuum of learning how to read. And Adria, that makes me think too about, um, so my son has autism and some other things that are, are neurodivergent. And there's this saying, like when you meet one person with autism, you've met one person with autism, right? And so I think with dyslexia, there are often these ideas about this is what dyslexia means, or this is what it looks like. Um, and like, as I'm learning more, seeing like, oh, no, 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 actually, it's a constellation of things. Um, different factors can look very different, like as you've mentioned in various people, and that there is this kind of continuum. So it's really interesting to me that there are some parallels to other kinds of neurodivergence as well. So I'm really glad that you lifted that up. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, that's, a, that's a great example. Again, um, the other big myth and the thing that I think is the hugest, the biggest takeaway from today is um, this myth that people with dyslexia cannot learn to read. And I think this is where the article, um, the Cats and Petra article that was sent out, um, really makes that part stand out and highlights it um, more. I mean, the dyslexia handbook clearly implies that we have to, that we, that all students um, can learn to read. All students, most students with dyslexia can learn to read. Um, but this article, I think, highlights that more in terms of uh, what we can do. And so I just want to share um, one project that I was not involved with, but I know a lot about. Um, when I was at Syracuse University, there was a longitudinal study going on um, where, uh, led by Dr. Benita Blackman, and they had um, worked with students in second and third grade um, with really good reading instruction and um, worked with the students who were uh, below the 25th percentile in their word decoding, which is uh, one of the clearest risk factors um, for dyslexia. And as part of this big study, when those students were in second and third grade, they were flown out to the Yale Child Study Center and had an fMRI of the brain functioning and some of the, uh, the brain um, illustrations in this Michigan Dyslexia Handbook were, were taken from some of that research. And so um, anyway, Dr. Blackman was in charge of the instructional part of teaching these kids um, who were all mostly inner city um, Syracuse uh, students. And um, so they did the, the brain scan before they did the intervention, and then they did reading instruction, high quality, um, evidence-based research, uh, reading instruction uh, during their second and third grade years. And then they had, it was a high quality study. So it was a randomized control trial of students who got the, the instruction and students who didn't. 
And then um, after the uh, instruction, they sent them back to Yale Child Study Center and did another fMRI. And they showed that these teachers who implemented this instruction had the power to change the connections and more efficiently utilize those mm -hmm. ligand centers in the brain. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just think the power of instruction has mm -hmm. been shown over and over and over again mm -hmm. um, in, in that particular study in, and it's been replicated mm -hmm. in other studies, not with that, that brain scan really, you know, brings it home for us. And the other thing that really brings it home for me is they did a 10 year follow up with those, those same students and found that they were less likely to need special education services. Mm -hmm. So showing that that early instruction is so powerful. And you know what that makes me think about, Adria, is um, one of the factors that's talked about as a resilience factor in this model is growth mindset, right? And so that, that applies both to the little humans, right, who have dyslexia and also their teachers, whether those are school-based, community-based, you know, their own family, you know, do they believe that these children can, can learn to read, right? Um, and just... Um, the tremendous power of that and how it connects connects to perseverance, right? So um, neural pathways are malleable, right? Like we know this, that they're not these like hardwired from birth kind of thing. So yeah, and I love that you're lifting up the power of great instruction because that's so much at the heart of what we care so deeply about. You know, we have community partners who, um, some of them have been serving families in Detroit for generations. They're like deeply engaged and valued, like they're beloved members of communities and they want to support literacy and that's amazing. And we want to make sure they have access to what they need, you know, to do that really well and have that impact. And I just see their lived commitment, you know, to, to learning and doing better. Um, so thank you so much for lifting up the power of that. Like it truly is important. Yeah. Yeah. I love how you called that. The growth mindset has to be for uh, the big humans <laughs> too. And I think that's where this article um really complements the Michigan Dyslexia uh, handbook in that it highlights that power and that it's changeable um, by by these amazing dedicated generations of fantastic volunteers and educators in the Detroit area that's um, so exciting to, Walking into some of these classrooms, I mean, walking into a first grade classroom, especially and watching these teachers do what they do, it just makes me, <laughs> makes my heart sing. <laughs> um, and, and so a couple of the other things that um, the handbook highlights that Michigan is working on doing to try to bring that instructional piece to play is, um, making sure that it's early enough. Um, that is something um, that I can't ever overemphasize how important it is to start before kids get frustrated, before kids get to that point of, before kids and adults get to that point of thinking it's not malleable anymore, that this is just the way it is. Um, before we get to that point and before we get to a gap that's that's so wide that makes kids um, very frustrated in, in the classroom is we can provide that instruction early on, which is why um, the, the screening tools and the assessment tools are mobilized so early. So kindergarten, first and second grade is where the science suggests we can have the most power and it's identifying and it's making sure that instruction is going to happen. And so um, Michigan's doing that by tying it, making sure there's funds for um, screening. And then I'll, I'll uh, in a second, turn it over to you, Leah, to talk about what, what 313 Reads is doing with that screening part of it. Um, but then the other piece they're doing in schools is having those individualized reading intervention plans mm -hmm. that are aligned directly to, to, to what's being found there. And then they are also providing a lot of uh, coaching for general education teachers because there's children with dyslexia in every single classroom. And it's helping um, uh, 
classroom teachers not just identify who those kids are, but rather make sure there's reading instruction equitably for all of the kids who may have dyslexia, may be at risk for dyslexia, or may um, just benefit from that same type of really high quality mm -hmm. instruction. And teachers have so much curricular materials, it's really difficult to navigate to which pieces are going to be the most influential and most effective to have those long-term outcomes. So it's helping them identify those pieces. So yeah, Leah, do you wanna talk about the assessment part? Um, yeah, but first I wanted to comment on something you said, Adria, in that um, like for so many years, it was this wait to fail model, right? Um, and we're really, you know, um, working collectively, like in schools and community to push back at that, that we don't wait for kids to get to, you know, third grade and quote unquote fail at reading, right? And so um, it's things like with um, things like the IRIP or individualized reading improvement plans, like very young, getting a sense of, you know, where are they at? What kinds of supports? And also naming that some of the things that we know support students with dyslexia, like very systematic, explicit code-based instruction, it benefits all kids, right? So it's it's promotive of strong literacy, but it actually has even greater impact for children with dyslexia, right? So it's, and it makes me think about so many things in special education that we do in classrooms now actually started in special education. And then we realize not only does it help these students who have these kinds of you know, learning profiles and needs, but it, but it helps all students. And so it kind of, to me, connects to that idea of like universal design for learning, right? So when you design a park and you put a, a ramp on it, it does make it accessible to children in wheelchairs, right? But it's also like you're building that in like sort of from the beginning. Um, yeah, and 313 Reads for us, we mobilize a common assessment. Um, it's called a cadence. Um, so it's uh, through an online platform. The, the paper version, which many places still use, um, is Dibbles. Um, and we're really excited to be able to mobilize that across our partners. But a big part of it also is um, how do we use those data to see, okay, where are the strengths, where are the areas of need, and how do we use this to not, you know, wait uh, to fail, but to really um, address some of the specific needs. And so we had a session, you can look for it in the, the previous um, recordings. Um, and I know we'll share a link for that, I think, right, Amber or Elise? Like, yeah, okay. Um, um, but we did have a cadence come and talk to us about which um, of the subtests in that larger battery of assessments could be used to screen for dyslexia. And I think that's the tricky thing too. People still think there's like a test for dyslexia, right? You're going to take this litmus test and it's going to tell you if you have dyslexia or not. And, you know, I think that that's the messiness of, I still remember this piece I heard um, on National Public Radio. It was called um, Dyslexia, the Learning Disability That Must Not Be Named. Um, and Elise, I dropped that, the link in if you're able to share comments. But we're still kind of fighting this, right? And you brought up the, the handbook, Adrian. I'm really glad that you did because, you know, part of the reason that this is also an equity issue and that, you know, we're so deeply invested in, in supports for this is that, you know, schools, teachers are often told like, no, 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 like, you know, we don't talk about Bruno, we don't talk about dyslexia, right? Like you can't say this. And, you know, the state is really clearly saying like, yes, we want to name dyslexia. We want to name what are risk factors for it. We want to address it. We want to have supports in place. Um, but it's really shifting that culture. Um, and I know I, um, uh, worked really deeply with Michigan Department of Education around some teacher preparation standards. And part of that was helping them to um, identify risk factors for dyslexia. And people felt really uncomfortable with that, like at this table that we had at the state level, because it was, no, teachers shouldn't be talking about this. So um, I really hope that folks have a chance to to take a look at that handbook. And that impacts not just school-based educators, right, but all literacy champions. So that when we're serving kids in community and we see, wow, we're, we're doing these things that, um, that we know are very aligned with evidence-based practices, we're not seeing the growth. Oh, you know, maybe there's something else there. Um, and I wonder if, you know, maybe we could talk a little bit next about this model, because again, previously it was, you know, it's this sort of core phonological processing deficit. That's what dyslexia is. There you go. And this model says, no, it's like actually about multiple risk factors and how those 
co-occur and the interplay with those. And then of course it's, um, there are also resilience factors. So maybe we could talk a little bit about that framework because I, I think it, again, truly for me, it was like mind blowing and so relevant to, to our community and our babies. So relevant. And uh, it ties kind of nicely into the um, assessment discussion that you just uh, had um, because um, the assessments that you're mobilizing and ones that schools are using identify some of the, the phonological and language pieces that are really critical to understand um, for that instruction component. Um, the, the piece that I like about this is usually that's where, the piece I like about this um, article is usually that's where our, our assessment stops. And sometimes, um, without additional explanation, it can give this mindset that you talked about earlier, Leah, that because these um, deficits or impairments exist, there's nothing that can be done. And it leads to then in instructional implications and IEPs where the things that are on the IEP are, are some important things like having text read aloud to students. It's a really important accommodation and we, we need to have that while students are being taught to read um, so that they can have access to, to grade level text in the classroom. However, um, if we have that mindset of that's the only thing that can be done because it's not a changeable, malleable thing and our focus is oh, there's this brain-based thing that can't be changed. Therefore, the only solution is to accommodate. Um, we're, we're shortchanging our children and it's a severe equity issue that we're not, pro that we're not providing those uh, resilience factors, that growth mindset of it can be changed. And we have effective ways to do that through instruction. And so, um, uh, Hugh Katz and Jakob Petcher in the article talk about um, some of those, those areas for instruction. So providing it early, um, providing it in ways um, like uh, Benita Blackman in her study identified, which is what Leah said earlier, this explicit code-based instruction. Um, and, and students can learn how to read in that way. Um, helping students to, to understand that they, that they can um, learn how to read and then providing um, engagement. And also um, the, the other piece um, with the risk factor, uh, like the trauma and stress um, piece of it, I, I, I feel like um, this model helps us to pull away from any unintentional blame to, to families and environments and communities, um, because that's often a, a thing we hear, right? Oh, if, if only um, this child had been read to more. That's absolutely not the case. You can read to, to your child, you could be three standard deviations above the mean about how much you, you read to your child and they still have dyslexia. That is um, not the case of, um, where dyslexia comes from. And this article really clearly um, highlights that. I see you wanna make a comment, Leah. No, I just, I love the example that they gave, they compared it to cardiovascular health, right? So that there are risk factors, right? So it might be like diet, obesity, genetics, right? As the same with dyslexia. So, you know, exercise, like all these things that doctors routinely screen for risk factors, right? And, um, so when we think about like the occurrence and occurrence rates of dyslexia, just thinking about, yes, you know, there are children from all families, all kinds of families that have dyslexia, but thinking about for us and our coalition um, and thinking about 303 Reads in Detroit, that because our children largely, not universally, um, are experiencing more risk factors such as, um, living in communities marginalized to the point of poverty, um, having identities aligned with minoritized communities such as black and brown individuals, um, uh, a barrier to access to books, um, 
and lack of access to high quality instruction for a lot of kids in our community because schools are understaffed, you know, class sizes are large, um, uh, spaces where more sort of like long-term subs that aren't yet, you know, certified are in those spaces, um, that our babies have more risk factors. So it's not, as you mentioned, like something inherently like, you know, nothing's wrong with our children. It's there are these risk factors, right? And the interplay of those. And so to me, it gets to, you know, so what do you do? I think, you know, before, you know, I, uh, I think I've always centered, you know, systematic, explicit, code-based instruction. It's like, yes. And thinking about things like um, access to books and supporting family literacy and addressing adverse childhood experiences, um, you know, supporting um, students' feelings of agency um, and growth mindset, like those are all things that we can do to promote resilience. But what I love about it is, as I was reading, I kept thinking like, oh, please don't go to grit. Please don't go to grit, right? Because it's this idea that like our babies don't know grit. Yeah, yeah, they do. Um, but it's really just, you know, like how can we help mediate and, and moderate those things? And so for me, if I think about like in this very boots on the ground kind of way, if I'm a teacher, if I'm a community-based literacy educator, like, what does this mean for me? Like, how does this change what I do? And I think, you know, part of it is we collectively stop looking for things like, I don't know, I remember when I was a teacher, it was like, oh, they reversed their B's and their D's, they must have dyslexia, right? So we started to see like, oh, these are some of the risk factors. Um, and like you said, it, it looks different in, you know, every human who has it, it can look different. And then what we do about it is around that explicit instruction, but is also in supporting some of these protective kinds of resilience factors. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to talk a little bit more oh. about that. So sorry, Adria. Uh, and specifically what some of our program partners can do and perhaps rethinking a little bit what an assessment that Through and Through Reads does, like our common assessment, yes, it includes things like those phonological and language issues, and we can also think about what is other data that we can collect about students to have a more like whole child understanding of each of our individual children, right? One of the benefits of being a community literacy champion, right, instead of maybe necessarily a teacher, an educator in a school, is that there is often a lot more flexibility that you can have in what you're doing day to day and how you're supporting students, right? So it could be, oh, hey, I noticed the student maybe actually might need to be screened for getting a pair of glasses. I can connect with some free and low cost community organizations to get the student glasses that they may not necessarily have had time for that could be accounting for some of the issues with reading. Alternatively, when we look at some of those resilience factors, yes, we're spending a lot of time on this explicit code-based instruction and we're making space to have authentic, genuine and strong connections with families and communities to build that village around students to support them in a multitude of ways, including with those things that you highlighted, Leah, the growth mindset that's super important, things like adaptive coping strategies, being able to have group sessions about social emotional learning and those types of contents. That is where I feel like our program partners are really uniquely positioned to really understand our children and support them in a multitude of ways that quite often a lot of schools do not have the time or the funding to be able to fully implement. Yeah, Amber, I'm really glad that you lifted that because this is something that at our coalition level, particularly our summer and out of school timetable, has lifted up, um, you know, we measure what matters, right? And if we're only measuring like, what's the reading level? What's the reading level? Like, that's, that's not the only thing that matters. And by just continuing to measure reading level, we're not getting at some of these risk and resilience factors. So they, our table members have centered, you know, wanting to have better understandings of social emotional learning and things like that. Um, so thanks so much for lifting that up, Amber. I'm just, I'm really hearing the voices of um, chairs of that table and program partners and what they're calling for as well. And these are the folks who are, you know, living the boots on the ground work of, serving, you know, children and community. And I believe I, I was cutting you off a little bit, Adria, so I don't know what you were going to say kind of in response to some of those things earlier. You, I, I think you address those resilience factors so much better than I could possibly do so. So I will just highlight one more piece of it in that the the task-focused behavior, I just want to reframe that a little bit because I can see how that 
um, task focused behavior can be put on the child a little bit more of is the child um, engaging in the task, but really I want to highlight that that's about providing opportunities um, in the environment for children to engage with with any type of reading or relationship building in the ways that Amber highlighted. And um, that is the heart of what your uh, coalition partners are doing is providing more opportunities for kids to engage with their peers and their communities, engage with the um, caring adult humans in, in their life, um, in their families, in those programs. And so I just want to um, pull that piece in, into there as uh, it, it's all a cohesive whole um, in, in those things that you're highlighting. So thank you. Mm -hmm. And Adrian, I was wondering if you could talk a little about uh, a little bit about it. It was mentioned in um, the article, and I'm going to get the acronym wrong, but I think it's EARS, which you worked with some colleagues to develop a tool for. So, um, I, like, I was excited and was hoping you could share a little bit about that today. Yeah, cool. I was actually surprised to see it mentioned in the article too. Um, so many years ago, I was at the Florida Center for Reading Research and working. Jakob Petcher, uh, who's the second author on this, him and I worked very closely together on a whole lot of projects. Um, but one of the really cool things um, that Florida had many years ago, they no longer do, but <laughs> um, years ago when they were doing a really good job of um, ensuring uh, lots of kids learned how to read, was they had this um, statewide database of Dibbles. Um, so all of the measures that are part of the cadence, um, which, which you all utilize and a lot of schools use. Um, the state of Florida, they've been collecting that information for all of their students, grades K through five, um, starting in 2002. And so there's this longitudinal database of every single child um, in, in their kindergarten, first, second, and third grade year, they took the Dibbles three times a year and it went into this database. And so Yaakov is a pretty talented statistician, um, took that database and looked at um, the same kiddos in their measurements in kindergarten, first, second, and third grade, and then looked at outcomes at third grade. So these were, um, national norm referenced outcomes in vocabulary and reading comprehension, as well as state level reading comprehension. So um, they have the FCAT, which is similar to our MSTEP in third grade. And so um, we thought, oh, hey, since we have this longitudinal information uh, about, about these kids, the same kids from kindergarten, first, second, and then their outcomes in third grade, um, let's put together a predictive tool that will see if how well do these um, these screening assessments that we're all using now across the country, how well do they predict um, that uh, reading success at the end of third grade? And um, then can we create this, take mine that table and create a usable app for um, others to use if you have that exact same kind of data, which your partners now have that same kind of data, you can plug it into this app, it, uh, taking kindergarten data, first grade data, wherever your kids are at, plug in the numbers, how they did on nonsense word fluency, oral reading fluency, for example, and it'll give you a probability of them reaching proficiency at third grade in reading comprehension or vocabulary. And so um, we, we find this to be pretty exciting for both schools and families um, to really uh, own their, be able to access and interpret um, what this, this is telling and um, giving the impetus to say, hey, we need to put in place as many of these resilience factors as possible now that we know about this one um, one risk factor and we can we can say what the urgency is of this mm -hmm. um, by having that probability of success. That's really interesting. And it makes me think of the ages and stages questionnaire, the ASQ. So that's used pretty broadly for young children to identify risk factors for things like autism, right? And so 
um, when you get a certain threshold number on the, the screener, I don't remember, it's been a while since I took it uh, for my son. Um, but that was the first thing that sort of flagged, you know, this kid could have autism um, and his is very high functioning. So even as an educator, I, like, I didn't know, I wasn't quite sure. Um, and the power of that isn't just to label, here's a child who's you know at risk for having autism, but to use that to inform, you know, do you want to have um, you know, a more robust kind of evaluation and um, looking at some of the like social pragmatics of language and noticing that there are some needs there, like, okay, like there you intervene early, you begin with things like early on and different kinds of state funded home-based um, support, right? So someone was coming to our home weekly to work with them on some of these things. Um, that also meant that we qualified for some kinds of programming because he had that score. So I, I think that's the thing I wanna center, like our babies have been tested and tested and tested, but it's how do we use that to make sure that it means that they have and families have and programs have access to what they need to support the little humans, right? So it's about what we do with it that matters. And Amber, I, um, I wanna pass it to you. Yeah, I just wanna go back to what we've talked about previously, which is high quality instruction benefits all students, right? There are things that we're doing in the classroom that benefit all students, regardless of if they have dyslexia or another reading difficulty or disability. And all of these resilience factors benefit all students, regardless of how they're performing on reading, if they're at grade level or above, right? So incorporating more social emotional learning, talking about coping strategies for difficult issues, um, family and peer support helps all children. These are things that are not, okay, we need to have this screener to see who, what child might have dyslexia, and then we can implement some, you know, more intensive peer support. That's not the case. We can do it for everyone. All program partners can do it for all children. Yeah, and there was another example in the article that really um, that really stood out to me, Amber, connected to what you said, which was this idea that, and I've, I've got the article up, um, that there are these um, factors that broadly promote, um, you know, things that are effective or healthy. And so they talked about promotive um, factors for better outcomes um, is things like, um, a well-balanced diet, right? Like that's just a promotive factor for good health for everyone. So when we have food and nutrition programs that, you know, ensure that all children and families are having access to, to like healthy, fresh nutrition, that helps everyone. But then when we think about protective factors, they mentioned that for individuals with PKU, um, I'm not going to try to actually pronounce the name, with PKU, which is a metabolic disorder, that a diet low in protein is a protective factor for good health, right? So it's this sort of, yes, these promoter factors like benefit all children. And then thinking about things like um, specific supports for that child as well are some of those um, protective pieces. Um, and so maybe we could sort of stay in this space of, you know, we've sort of talked about, um, you know, the difference between sort of a, a, a traditional model, if you will, of dyslexia, which, even that model has come a long way. I mean, I remember when I first started um, becoming an educator, it was all about, um, I might say it wrong, so correct me, Amber or um, Adria, if I'm saying it wrong, Erlen, Erlen overlays. Am I saying that right? Erlen? Is it Erlen? Okay. It, it was this idea that you give a child a, a sheet of colored acetate and put it over the page. And if they have dyslexia, like it's going to help them read, right? And for some children with some of those, when we look at this model that's up here, maybe with visual um, problems, visual perception, maybe some things like that will help with that risk factor. But it wasn't this panacea, right? Like, oh, use an overlay and they can read. Um, and then it was this idea like, um, well, it's, you know, phonological processing. You know, there's not a lot we can do. And now we understand like, Adria, that example you gave us where, you know, MRI showed differences in neural pathways, the brain was actually, you know, being restructured in really observable ways, like, yeah, there's a hell of a lot we can do, right? Um, and really understanding that it's this balance between risk and resilience, and that even a child who some of those risk factors are like genetic pre predisposition to uh, maybe some um, oral language um, deficits, maybe some phonological processing challenges still with some of those resilience factors can still be successful as reading, right? So as we think about that, um, I'd love to, as we're kind of, you know, coming closer to the end, um, to just open it up to if there are any comments or questions from folks who are joining us today, 
Um, and I know Elise will, will lift those up. Um, but, but what this means in a really boots on the ground kind of way, um, because I love that we come together to talk and learn, but also it's for action, right? Because uh, when we learn these things and unpack them and talk about them, it changes what we do. And in changing what we do, that's what's going to have the impact we seek. Um, so I'd love to sort of open that up a little bit. Yeah, while we're waiting for some of those questions to come in, there are a couple of things like action items that I'm feeling like we can take both at three and three reads kind of with the backbone team, but as well as some of our program partners and conversations that we can have about moving forward. One of those things is really expanding our idea of what our common assessment looks like. So including things like, yes, we would love to know what your like literacy programming and curricula look like and what are some of these other resilience factors that you're doing and, and how can we bolster those and how can we also be, you know, a kind of resource for them, right? So are you incorporating any social emotional learning? How can you do that? Are you like, I don't even know what this is and what is it doing? And then what do we see from students maybe pre and post or six months afterwards or what mm -hmm. have you, right? Incorporating those ideas in addition to looking at what are some of these phonological and, and language processing issues that some students may have. I think it's really important to expand upon. Let's mm -hmm. look at each individual child. Again, I really want to go back to our program partners are in such a unique position to really provide a lot of different supports in a lot of different areas to our, our children. And that's really, really powerful. And I'm so mm -hmm. excited to, mm -hmm. to kind of talk with program partners more about what might be best in that realm. Yeah. And I think piggybacking off that, Amber, um, our program partners, our coalition has lifted up like we know that one of the strongest predictors of children's literacy success, dyslexia or not, is their primary caregiver's literacy level. So often that's the mother's literacy level, right? And um, our coalition has lifted up, if we really want to have impact on grade level reading, on early literacy, it can't be this in isolation that we have to also have supports and intentionality collectively around supporting adult literacy, family literacy. Um, Detroit has, um, it's around 50%, it might be 47, I, I don't remember the exact number, but um, around 47% of Detroiters are functionally illiterate, right? And this, this doesn't mean um, that we don't understand the complexities of the intersect of access to literacy with poverty and um, oppression and all these other kinds of systems. But the reality is, if we have around half of our babies in homes where they're, they don't have access to primary caregivers um, with literacy at some of the same levels in other spaces, like that has implication. But how do we name that without doing it in a way that's deficit framing, but builds on the assets of families and communities and honors those? Um, and our coalition has named, yes, you know, in the first years of our coalition, it was just early literacy. And our coalition has said, no, like programs are also interested in how do you support family literacy. Um, so I think about like one of our partners, um, they are um, a co-backbone for us is Brilliant Detroit. And Brilliant Detroit and Black Family Development, they mobilize a program called 313 Speaks. And that is a model where they have play groups for parents coming together with their little babies uh, and little toddlers to help promote oral language and vocabulary and literacy. And things like that, that are, you know, that promoter factor, like it's good for all little humans and families, but particularly where children are experiencing multiple risk factors, that's going to have even more impact for them, right? So, um, so just thinking about how much our coalition just in the last year has centered, no, family literacy and adult literacy have to be part of supporting children's literacy as well. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation and I uh, wish we had more time to continue it. And just want to say thank you to our guests, Dr. Truck and Miller, Amber and, and Leah. But before we go, I know that you've dropped some, some nice nuggets here on, on our way out, but what are some of your takeaways specifically for our program partners? Dr. Truck and Miller? 
Great. Thanks so much, Elise, for facilitating this. This has been a lot of fun having this conversation. Um, uh, one of the biggest things that I hope people will use is what you just dropped in the comments. Um, there is this amazing set of um, activities, and, and this ties into the last comment that Leah made um, really well of, of things that families can do together um, to support to support um, literacy development. And so this uh, YouTube channel playlist has um, several phenomenal activities and shows um, families working together on these activities. And it's a, it's a great, wonderful resource. Um, the, the biggest thing that I'm taking away from today, and uh, of course, I think Leah said it best, is um, thinking about um, children and adults all being malleable and uh, every we can we can meet this goal of um, children learning how to read um, and putting into place the things that will will facilitate that and pulling pulling the blame away from the kids and the families and the communities um, because that's that's not the intention although um, a lot of the actions that we've taken in the past um, continue to promote that and I, I hope we can change the direction on that. Thank you so much. And Amber, what's your takeaway for our audience? Uh, my takeaway truly is just living in like purpose and power of there are so many things that we all can do collectively to really get at our heart and our mission, right? Which is to increase the number of children and adults and families, like we talked about again, Leah, that know how to read because once you know how to read right you have access to a wide variety of things reading is really connected to so many important things in life important outcomes but also just things that i think of self-esteem and self-empowerment and those things as well and i just i feel so yeah i just feel so grateful and purposeful in the work that i'm doing and the work that our entire coalition is doing that's amazing how about you leah yeah, ditto, ditto to what both of my uh, colleagues have said. But I think also it's this space of, I often use this hashtag better together. And you'll see it in some of um, 313 reads, like our website and spaces, like we are better together. And also centering vulnerability. We have to have a space to come together and say, I, I don't know everything about this, whether it's dyslexia or something else related to literacy. Um, but I care. We all care. Let's learn about it together. And having that, what I really value in our um, coalition is folks coming together, whether it's school-based or community-based to say, you know, we don't have all the answers, but we can figure this out together um, and rolling up sleeves together. And I just really, as we're talking about um, this and Amber really highlighting all that our partners are um, and will continue to do and can do to um, really support what's happening in schools so we don't have this chasm between school-based literacy and community-based literacy. Um, I'm just really feeling the power of better together in regards to dyslexia as well. Well, thank you everyone for, for joining us. We hope that we have added to your knowledge bank and helped further equip you in your work towards literacy access, equity, and justice to support grade level reading. Please visit our website to access additional resources, to sign up for our monthly newsletter, or for more information about the coalition. And you can access all of our videos from our professional learning series on our Facebook page. Today's 313 Reads professional learning series was made possible by the Skillman Foundation and the United Way of Southeastern Michigan. Thank you again, and we'll see you next time.